Most of us never learned how to train our brains, which is why most of us needlessly settle, struggle, and worse, suffer. My name is Chris Doris, and I want to make brain training mainstream. This is my series, Tough Talks, Conversations on Mental Toughness. I'm interviewing badasses from all walks of life on what mental toughness means to them and their unique approaches to strengthening their minds. What's happening, Tough Talks Tribe? Welcome back. Today, our guest is Carolyn Fryer Jones. I met Carolyn maybe a decade, maybe a little bit less than that through, um, at the time, our mutual coach, someone who I've worked with a few times. And I, and I know you've heard me reference his name many times, Steve Chandler. <laughs> his nickname is the godfather of coaching. And Carolyn works with him, has worked with him closely in different capacities as uh, he has been her coach. And they've also uh, worked together at the University of Santa Monica as faculty. But let me, let me share, um, I haven't actually spent a lot of time with Carolyn. In fact, I've, I've only actually been in her physical presence, I think, once. Uh, when I met her initially at one of Steve Chandler's um, coaching programs when I was enrolled as a, as a student in his coaching prosperity school is what it was called at the time. So Carolyn, or CFJ, um, has been coaching women and men for over 18 years, assisting them in their growth as leaders. Her clients include corporate executives, business owners, authors, lawyers, television hosts, salespeople, and more. Carolyn has supported clients in becoming more effective decision makers and leaders, launching new businesses, strengthening relationships, transforming careers, and experiencing greater success and fulfillment. She facilitates leadership workshops in corporations all over the world. Carolyn's a longtime champion of women. She developed and facilitated a series of dynamic women's coaching groups called Self Mastery for Professional Women with her business partner, Michelle Bauman as well as weekend intensives. She leads one-day intensives and groups for female executives on women and leadership, shattering the inner glass ceiling. She developed the University of Santa Monica's soul-centered professional coaching program. I, and I, I really want to ask her some questions about that. I want to know more about that because it sounds so fascinating. And I have met so many people who've gone through that program. And she did that with uh, doctors Ron and Mary Holnick, Steve Chandler, uh, Michelle Bauman, and Stephen McGee, who is a former uh, Tough Talks guest. She graduated with a master's degree in spiritual psychology in 1998 from the University of Santa Monica and considers the principles and practices of spiritual psychology to be the foundation and springboard for her work in the world as well as her professional life. She now has her own school for professional coaches called the CFJ Coaching Success School, and teaches coaches from all over the world skills and tools for growing a thriving coaching business that makes a difference in the lives of others. She lives in L.A. with her husband, John, and her 11-year-old daughter, Lucinda, where she crossfits regularly and loves enjoying coffee and traveling to faraway places. Let's go find CFJ. And here she is, Carolyn Fire jones Hello, my friend. Hey, how you doing? Amazing. Good. Absolutely. It's the best day of my life. <laughs> And you're a huge part of that. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you for, for making time for us here at Tough Talks and sharing your beauty, your wisdom, your insights. And, um, you know, I, I, I just read your bio, which is very, it's incredible, the amount of contributions that, that you're making. But there's something that I wanted to add to your bio. There was an addendum that came from one of your um, a CFJ Coaching Success School fellow um, faculty members. Uh, uh, one Devin Bandison. <laughs> uh, I, I visited with him yesterday and told him that we're going to be doing this. And he was very, very pumped about that. And he said, you know what, Karen's like, she's like, she's like straight talk New York mixed with compassion. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I don't know that it gets better than that. I agree. I, I don't think it does get better than that. But then he said, kind of like me. And I said, no, not kind of, yeah, kind of being the operative word in that. <laughs> Devin is a former guest on Tough Talks, as a matter of fact. Yeah, he's a great so, guy. Yeah. One of my favorite people. Me too. So let's start with big picture. I, I love to ask this question to people like you. Um, why coaching? Of all the things that you could be doing with your life, of all the possible ways that you could be choosing to profoundly use this miraculous life of ours, why this? It's a good question. It's funny because I don't really see it any other way, right? Like, um, you know, my background, really my path started 
uh, you know, I mean, I could say it started in college, right? I was an RA in college, a resident mm -hmm. assistant. Mm -hmm. And that in and of itself, right, has some sort of coaching-esque components to it. Okay. I, w I wouldn't have called it that, but that's the truth, right? Like you're serving other students and you're getting to help them with whatever they're dealing with. And I loved that. Mm -hmm. And um, But more importantly, really, when I – ended up becoming a student at the University of Santa Monica in their master's program in spiritual psychology. I mean, really, in some ways, Chris, for me, that was a place where I started to really, like, see, I have, like, I had gifts to share in this arena that I hadn't really, prior to that, considered. Mm -hmm. I just had it. I was working in marketing. It was all fine. You know, just this, this um, real love of being with people and connecting with them about their lives and helping them um, really was birthed, my real love of that was birthed in the USM classroom. Now it took a while for it to go from that to me being a professional coach. That's, that's like a, a journey there. But that's where that love was really birthed in a more formal way where I was like, you know, when I saw Drs. Ron and Mary Hulnick at the front of the room, yeah. I was like, people do this? For a living? <laughs> what does it say? People do this. What? Elaborate a little bit on the this. Facilitate people in their growth and transformation. Oh, okay. I mean, I, I had never done any kind of group work. I'd been in therapy. I loved it. But I wasn't, I wasn't in love with the idea of becoming a therapist. Mm. But when I sat in that classroom and watched them facilitate people in their transformation and growth in really profound sometimes uncomfortable ways, I was like, who does this? How does, mm. how does this exist? Yeah. And I didn't know about it. So that was so huge for me that it took a long time for me to see myself as someone who could also do that. What initially, so the, the program you're referring to is the, the uh, spirit, spiritual psychology program at the University of Santa Monica. So I know like a jillion people who've gone there. I've never been there. Right. So, um, what, so I'm so fascinated with it, right? Um, what is it about that program that attracted you in the first place? Uh, you know, it's really hard to know, Chris. I was young, right? I was 28. Yeah. I was relatively newly married. And I was thinking maybe, I wasn't really that satisfied at work. And I was like, maybe I'll, maybe I'll become a therapist. Like that was kind of the only thing I could think of. But mm -hmm. I knew, I knew that like I was not going to go to grad school in a traditional way because I would shoot myself if I had to sit in a classroom and just hear someone talk. But I didn't know how to find something that was different. I just knew that wouldn't work for me. Sure. And I came across this article in the, in the LA Times about why people move from France to Los Angeles, right? Because who would? Why would you move from Paris to Los Angeles? Hmm. And a woman in the article said, the only reason I moved from France to Los Angeles was because of the graduate program in spiritual psychology <laughs> at the University of Santa Monica. I was like, what's that? Yeah, yeah. I was like, I got to find out more. And when I went, Chris, to the information night, which is like your standard information night, yeah. something, they were, they're very, I mean, Ron and Mary are like, they're academics. They're very traditional looking. They don't look radical. They're not Tony Robbins. They, that's not their thing. Mm -hmm. But they, they, they're, they really have created a program where people can learn how to connect with themselves and live more authentically. And, and really, these are my words, sure. uh, get rid of some of the big stuff that's been in their way in their mm -hmm. lives. But so the program is not to become a coach. That's not what it's designed for. Oh. My husband went through the program and he works in television production. Okay. And oh, this is, oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. I'm so glad oh, yeah. you're saying that. I didn't even know that. Oh yeah. Lawyers go there. Parents go there. Doctors go there. You know, people don't go there to become coaches. They go there because they hear that there's this curriculum that will assist them in becoming more effective in their lives. As <laughs> You're getting a master's degree in you. Yeah, that's right? really so what it is. It's highly, it's a it's master's highly degree, right? experiential. Yeah. And you're mastering life. How interesting. And, and you're and learning the principles and practices of spiritual psychology. So you're learning a real um, curriculum where you're learning tools and skills for how to work with yourself and others more effectively. Just for fun, can we talk about maybe a couple of those? 
Sure. Like, what are some um, of the, what are your like MVPs that you took away? The, the, you know, the well, what I always say to people that mm -hmm. if you did anything, if you went to USM and you never did anything you learned there, with the exception of these three skills, your whole life would be different. Love it. Let's hear it. Heart centered listening. I'm sorry. What was that? Kidding. Heart kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Heart centered listening, seeing the loving essence. I'm writing these down, by the way. Seeing, seeing the loving, seeing the loving essence. Wow. And compassionate self forgiveness. I just if got you, chills. I'm so glad I asked. You only essence. did those three for yourself and others. Whether you're a coach or a doctor or a police officer, your whole life would change. Can we go through and, them a little bit? And I'll, I'll talk about seeing the loving essence because in some ways that one is probably people go, what is that? And that's really about, so spiritual psychology is set up in a way that's not about religion. That's not what this is about. Yeah. It's about acknowledging that in addition to the physical world, the, men the mental world and the emotional world, it acknowledges that we all have souls, that we're actually souls having a human experience. Mm. So seeing the loving essence is really learning how to walk around in the world with yourself and others and really get like, there's a, there's an essence in this person across from me. Mm. And even if I don't like what they're saying, and even if I'm bothered by what they're doing inside of them, <clears throat> a loving essence, just like me. And if I can have that awareness as I walk around in the world, that's a game changer. And let's face it, given what we're seeing in the world, right? If I could really acknowledge that people who I profoundly disagree with are, are a loving essence, just like I am, maybe we can all figure this out. Now I'm not hearing you, Chris. How about now? Oh, now I am. Oh, thank you. Thanks. I must, I, I hit the mute button on my microphone. Appreciate that. Uh, what I said was I couldn't love that more. Uh, and you're reminding me of an experience that I had last, exactly a year ago. Have you heard of A-Fest? I have. So I went to, yeah, and our buddy, our boy Jason Goldberg is yes. the host of that, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and I was with Devin last, so last year, this time last year. Well, you guys went. We went. And, and it was four days of, I, I, I think, in large part, this loving essence acknowledgement that you're talking about. They do an amazing job of that. Mm. So I left that four-day experience with a, just a full heart. And I was, um, I was vibing really, really high. Mm. And, um, and I'm going to live that way. What I did after A-Fest was over, since it was over in Sardinia, you know, I figured I'm all the way, I, I go over there for four days, may as well do something afterwards. Yeah. So I, I ended up going island hopping in the Greek islands uh, with no itinerary, just a flight in and wow. in 10 days, a flight out 10 days later. I didn't have one reservation, anything. Uh, so I didn't, it was all just a big question mark, right? The content and be yeah. arrived on departure date. And, it, and that was the recommendation of my birth mother, who's a remarkable world traveler. Mm. And uh, she insisted that that's what I do. She said, go to the islands, hop around, have no plan. Just go create magic. Couldn't have been better advice, uh, especially with the timing. She had no knowledge of what A-Fest was. Right. That was just perfect. Because <laughs> wow. then I brought this, this vibe, and, and, and I'm actually creating something. I don't know. I'm recording videos. There's 48 isolated stories of pure magic with, with just beautiful humans that, it, that were like so uh, – didn't know me from Adam and wanted to serve and help me and want nothing from me. And, and I know that that was because of – and I think it's what we're talking about, I think. That yeah. when I went into the, and, and I immediately, I brought the vibe into these interactions. And I think what I was doing was seeing the loving essence. I cried so many times with strangers, you know, and, uh, and didn't know anything about them. And, and just had nothing, nothing but joy. Man, what a magical experience. I hope that that's the, I think it's the same thing that we're talking I about. I think it is. And I think what's important is like, look, I don't want to mince words. When it's a challenging situation, it's a lot harder to see the loving essence in both ourselves and others, Right. If I'm upset yeah. or someone else is, it's a lot harder. So it's not a small task to live from that. And it's not um, a small endeavor. And, you know, spiritual psychology, I mean, look, what they've done there, I mean, they've been teaching that for over 35 years. And people's wow. 
people's lives have changed profoundly in terms of people go in there with um, really uh, big rifts in their families and in their marriages and in their professional lives. And they learn how to dismantle all that and, and really come from a different place. And so when I saw all that happen, I mean, I would sit in the classroom just with my jaw dropped. Like I couldn't believe the things people were talking about. I had no idea that, th that this was a work that I could do in my life. Hmm. Can we spend a couple minutes on the other two of the three? Yes. So, so heart centered listening is like, you know, it's really, how do you listen from your heart? How do you listen really fully to someone without any noise in my own mind and in my own head? How do I listen without agenda? How do I listen through the ears of my heart, essentially, um, for the love underneath what someone's saying, even if they're an upset? Mm. Mm -hmm. so that's heart centered listening. It's my, they have a very specific way they share about it, but that's, that's my, that's my yeah. short version. And yeah. then compassionate self forgiveness is really a tool. You know, one of the things I'm always looking for in my coaching is judgment. Like where are people, whether professionally or personally, where are they in judgment of themselves and of others? Cause judgment is really a huge thing that gets in the way for most of us in our lives. Mm -hmm. So often we're judging without knowing about it. Often we're judging and we just think we're thinking. We're not even, oh, I'm just, these are just my thoughts. And I'll say to someone, no, no, you're judging them. Mm. And I'm like, really? They're like, it's true. I'm like, mm, let, let me ask you some basic questions. I, yeah. <clears throat> um, so where's the problem in that? Yeah. <laughs> well, judgment. I mean, when I'm in judgment, I'm not exactly very connected to loving. Like I'm not connected to my heart and I'm not connected to possibility, right? If I'm judging my husband, yeah. I'm not connected to his essence and who he truly is and I'm not connected to my own. And if I'm in judgment, I'm cut off from possibility, right? Because uh, oh, like, like let's, yeah. let's take our, let's take our, let's take it bigger. Like, That's and I work with this, right? Like we have a president right now who many of us judge and are angry about. Mm -hmm. And I understand that, but I also know that judgment affects me. They've determined that when we're in judgment, we're physically weaker. It affects, oh, wow. our, it affects our immune system. So it's like, I'm not saying, I don't, I don't have to agree with our wow. president. I don't have to like his behavior. But when I'm judging him, I'm, I'm actually contributing to the sum total of negativity on the planet. Okay. Well, that's the problem. With that. So compassion itself, forgiveness is a tool where you can literally forgive yourself for the judgments that you have about yourself and others. Mm -hmm. so I do like Stephen McGee, who we taught the USM coaching program together. He would say to the students, I do self forgiveness every day throughout the day. It's like a walking prayer. So I'm in my car and I get mad at a driver. I'm like, Oh, I forgive myself for judging that driver as a blank. Fill in the blank. Yeah. It's like, you know, judging is human. It's, it's not like, let's pretend we're all not going to judge. It's going to happen. But mm -hmm. I want to be, I want to be acknowledged I'm judging and I want to do, do something to handle it. Because it makes you weaker. Yeah. And because, because it, it separates me. When we're in judgment of each other, we, we're separate from each other. We're not seeing the humanity. You know, we're not seeing that. We're not seeing what is really happening for people. You know, you said it's human, so let's not pretend we're not going to do it. It's going to happen. Yeah. Why, and this is, this is an esoteric question, but it's interesting. Like, why? Yeah, okay, it's human. Why do you think that became a part? Why is it so popular? <laughs> judging? That's yeah. a great, I love that. I've never heard judging and popular put in the same sentence, Chris. Um, <laughs> it's a good sentence. It's true, right? Like, you know, it's a really good question. I don't have an answer for that, but I mean, like, if we were to put it in a spiritual context, right? Mm -hmm. It's like we're here to learn and we're here to grow. So judging, it's like if it's human nature, then we get to learn how to come out from that. If we yeah. choose, some people are never going to come out of that. And that's okay too. I'm not here to pretend like everyone's going to learn how to judge less. Mm -hmm. Some people won't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that you're reminding me now of one of my favorite, maybe my, no, my favorite quote from Alan Watts. Oh yeah. Uh, are you familiar with Alan Watts? Yeah. yeah. So, um, he says, each of us is an aperture through which the universe observes itself. Only the game that we're playing is to not know that. Yeah. 
which then you could say, well, then of course, then the game, another way of saying that is that the game is too wait, awakened to that, then maybe judgment is part of the game. Yeah, or I think it's part awakened. of the game. I don't judge okay. judgment. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that, would be, that is paradoxical, isn't it? Oh, shame on me for being so judgmental. Exactly, and I have people who do that all the time, and I'm like, that's not helpful. I shouldn't judge so much. <laughs> right. Right. Yep. I shouldn't. So, uh, you that. know, there's some stuff, you know, your, your website is really full of some really fascinating language that I would love to, uh, to talk about for a second. Sure. Yeah. And, um, so clients I work with, so you're coaching clients, the clients I work with accept that fear is not a good enough reason to not do something. And I'm not interested in being fascinated by fear. Fear is it's just not that interesting. It's uncomfortable. <laughs> yes, it's compelling. Yes, it's understandable. Absolutely, positively. Yes, interesting. Not so much. Let's talk about that for a second because I deal a lot in, in my work and all of my work. I'm mean, fear, right? And and being not interested in it. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Well, look. I mean, it's like I, I have fears in my own life, but I I think we can get really fascinated, like with why am I so afraid and why am I afraid of talking to that person and why am I afraid of going on stage and yeah. giving a talk? And I'm like, you know, we could talk about why you're afraid right. all day long, but that's not what's going to get you into your life doing the things that you're afraid of. It's not. I mean, well, like, so you know, we don't need all this psychoanalysis, right? Okay. All right. This is really a big deal because I think a lot of people are convinced that they do like that. I have to, in order for me to get past this, I, I got to understand like, okay, so I'm sure this has something to do with my relationship with my mother. Right. <clears throat> An understanding is overrated. Yeah, uh, there's another sentence that goes right perfectly with this that you, that you articulate just in the next paragraph, which is the agreement that we make you and your clients, your coaching clients is that we don't use feelings as reasons for not moving forward. We don't use any feelings. That doesn't just say fear. That right. you said we just don't use feelings. Right. And I'm a, a fan of feelings. Like I'm, I'm someone. Right. It's like I'm, I'm a, I, I'm, you know, I work a lot with people and cultivating greater compassion for themselves. There are people who are really hard on themselves. I mean, you know, all day long. I mean, I have a new client right now, and even as she's telling me how she's not doing these things, it's like it's evidence of her limitations. And I'm like, are you aware that even in that sentence, you're being hard on yourself? Like you're judging the way you're thinking. And it's like, so feelings though are a part of life, right? They're feel like we all have feelings all day long. And as Steve Chandler, who we know and love, he's like, nobody ever got a feeling wrong. Oh, I never heard him say that. That's yeah. really cool. <laughs> nobody ever got a feeling wrong. You know how we do that in our families? Well, you're wrong about them. <clears throat> no, these are yeah. my feelings. They're not wrong. And Feelings are not facts. Like they're not like facts. They move. Feelings, it's like if I let myself be upset, eventually it'll lift, right? It just, they have a natural, when we people shove them down and they're like, oh, it's not okay to feel bad, they stay locked in there. And I'm like, but feelings are not like good enough reasons to not take action. But yet that is probably if not the number one excuse for inaction, it's, it's gotta be damn close to the top of the list. Right. Yeah. So, so then we have learned, we've been conditioned to believe this is, I'm putting, I mean to put this in question form. Then is all this to say that we have been conditioned to believe that we'll stick with fear. Cause fear is a huge sure. emotion with many sub sure. versions of it. Right. Um, I, I, well, actually, I guess there's, I've heard that uh, you, you could really just summarize, you could really reduce all of um, our emotional experience into two emotions, fear or love, right? right. And then all the other mm -hmm. emotions or categories of those. So uh, we have been conditioned then to believe that fear is, in fact, a legitimate reason to not move towards our desires. I, I think there's accuracy to that. And I want to also state, like, I'm a fan, I mean, look, University of Santa Monica is a place where people learn how to do deep inner work around the things that have gotten in their way, right? Like things that happened in their past, including my own. So I don't want to discount. There are things that have occurred in our past mm. that will stop us from creating our future. Those things have to get handled. I'm not saying just ignore them. Mm -hmm. And they can be handled and you can still move forward. 
It's like, like when people are saying that, oh, this thing happened and therefore I can never do this. I don't, I don't subscribe to that. Like I've had, I had, a, some people would say I had a wildly dysfunctional childhood mm -hmm. and I did. And I did a lot of work around that and it's not who I am. Like I'm not tied to that past. I'm, I've done a lot of work and I'm free of that. So I'm, I'm a fan of people doing work and moving forward in their lives. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. Like I, I need to go talk about my feelings for this period of time and then I'll move forward. Well, okay. So then that means I'm moving forward with my fear. Yeah. Oh, who does like, so, Well, th those who don't move forward, <laughs> right? So uh, because of the fear. Yeah. Right. Like I see fear of not knowing how, like, so I'm working with a lot of, I have worked with so many clients over the years that wanted something different for themselves. Like for example, just say pick, uh, this is a real one. Uh, someone who was making tons of money on Wall Street, hated it, uh, would totally wanted uh, to have a salsa shop in Key West. Wow, that's fun. Right. And, uh, and they did it. But they didn't do it for a long time because they, they put an enormous amount of time between them and their desire because of the fear of, of several things. One, of giving up their lifestyle, like not making enough money. Maybe the business wouldn't succeed. They were never really an entrepreneur. A Key West is expensive as hell, you know? Um, and they, you know, they, so all those questions. Yeah. Like, so it was fear of failure, fear of um, losing uh, income, fear, sure. uh, fear of losing the lifestyle, uh, which I think they ultimately discovered uh, that the, their lifestyle was upgraded <clears throat> tremendously by moving in the direction of their passion, but the fear is what paralyzed them. So, so um, we, uh, uh, most of us have not been educated on what you're talking about. Sure. Right. It's, it's, well, and it's proof, like, you know, uh, the Gallup industry does all the, you know, the, the census and all these polls. And one of the, one of the polls that they've been doing for 30 years, which blows my mind, is on American job satisfaction. And for 30 years, they've been getting totally consistent results that report 84% of Americans report disliking their careers. That, that's amazing to me. It's, that's saddening. Yeah. The I vast agree. majority of us are settling. And, and, I, you know, and I have to believe that a, a big part of that is, is fear. You know, yeah, I mean, there's fear and I think there's also like society like you know, look people stay in situations right out of like limiting beliefs around you know I would never be able to what if it doesn't go well and all those thoughts yep. that that like yeah. your work you help dismantle because they're not real they're made up right it's like fear it's like the whole idea of courage is not the absence of fear courage is doing something while afraid Oh, okay. So there you go. Well, let's, we got to talk. See, that's the paradigm shift. But we got to slow this down because this is a nugget right here. I'm feeling that. <laughs> okay. Good. Can you repeat that? Because I, I think that was a bomb. That was a mic drop moment. Yeah. I mean, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is doing something while afraid. Is that, is that? That's a quote. I mean, there's 8 million. I think there's not 8 million. There's a number of quotes that kind of do that. Yeah, but that. is that, I'm going to, you're, that one's yours. <laughs> Courage is not the absence of fear. It's moving forward with it. What, right. I, I'm, I'm, I'm moving. afraid a lot. I mean, yeah. I, okay. So I'm a long time CrossFitter. Uh -huh. and so that's why I love mental toughness, Chris, because that's yeah. a component of what they work with at my gym and they mm. talk about it. Nice. And, and, um, I do, I mean, I, I do stuff all the time that I'm afraid of at the gym, in my life starting a school for coaches. I mean, look, I mean, my business partner and best friend, Michelle Bauman, who passed away three years ago, I was in so many situations with her through her illness that I was afraid. I mm. was afraid mm. in hospitals with her situations I had never dealt with before. Mm. And I was afraid. Mm -hmm. And, and really it was so I, I had in those situations, I felt like I had no choice, right? Am I going to show up as her best friend and partner, even though I'm afraid? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about the mechanics of that, right? To see if anybody who's watching or listening could, um, could really take away some really practical, useful uh, guidance here 
on, on the mechanics of how, like, so let me ask you, how do you teach someone or how, or maybe not, how do you, how do you actually move forward with your fear? What are yeah. the things that you do that permit you to be able to move forward while you're still afraid? afraid. I mean, look, I think the th some of the work that I do with people and with myself in those situations is it's okay. There's nothing wrong with being afraid. I don't make myself wrong because I'm afraid. Like a lot of people are like, well, I shouldn't be afraid. And I don't know why this, I'm afraid. I'm like, let's just stop. So the, okay. first, so the first step then is to even acknowledge that, that fear does not need to be paralyzing. And, and it's not even that. Fear doesn't need to be judged. Fear is like, I don't want to make someone wrong because they're afraid. It's like, can we be, can we have, be accept our fears? Can we make room for them? And then we don't, we don't make them bigger than they are, right? Like, can I make room for my fear? I love that. So that, that's like Wu Wei in Chinese principles. Like, <laughs> it's like, it, it is. It's like not yeah. struggling against. It's, right, remove, it's like Tai Chi Chuan. It's like removing exactly. resistance and working with. Yes. So, okay, I'm afraid. Let's work with it. Let's, let's, let's have the fear come with me. Yeah. My fear goes that's with me everywhere I go. That's a huge paradigm shift. What? Say that again? My fear goes with me everywhere I go. You're giving me goosebumps. I'm like, hi, fear. It's like the third time. I love, these are amazing nuggets. I am so jacked about this conversation, Karen. This is so great. So glad. Yeah. Well, you got a lot to offer here. So, um, yeah, moving forward with my fear. Okay, so that's the first thing is that that's even a possibility. Yeah. Now, now talk to me about like, what do you, what do you say? Like, how do you talk? How does that change your self-talk? A big, oh, big time, right? Because that's a big piece of it for most people is like how they're relating to themselves when they're afraid. Most of us are like, come on, get with it. You know, what's wrong with you? Yeah. You, know, you have like an internalized parent who's like, get your act together. You should be able to do this better. What's wrong right. with you? What's right. the big deal? What are you afraid of? Yeah. Yeah. And that's not helpful, right? Like I don't want to move right. forward when I'm talking that way to myself. So a lot of it is learning like, well, how am I relating to myself as I'm afraid? Is okay. there permission to be kinder to myself when I'm afraid? That doesn't mean stop moving forward. It just means can I, can I, the way I like to talk to people about it these days is like, can I take myself by the hand and go, I get that you're afraid. Let's keep going. <laughs> like, I get it. It's like, how would you talk to a five-year-old who was afraid or a three-year-old? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? We can all relate to that. Like I always say to people, like if a baby, when a baby's learning to walk, we don't go, come on, get on it. <laughs> What's wrong with you? Like right. we, we're like, oh, you made one step. Great. And can we be that way with ourselves around fear? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's beautiful. That's profound. <clears throat> There's something else in your, in the language on your homepage. Which, by the way, is your name. Your, your website is carolynfriarjones.com, which yes. is, and it's spelled C-A-R-O-L-Y-N-F-R-E-Y-E-R jones.com. Yep. And um, it, it, so here's the other piece which really caught my attention. So over and over again, my experience is that when my clients sit with me, bringing their lives into the quiet space where they can hear the voice of their hearts, Miracles can occur. Miracles of inspiration, fulfillment, creativity, deeper peace, joy, and real, tangible, long-lasting results. Let's, let's go there. Bringing their lives into the quiet space where they can hear the voice of their hearts. Talk to me. <laughs> I love how you ask questions, Chris. Um, I mean, look, it's really about like most executives don't ever give themselves time to think. Like, let's mm. just boil it down. Like when I coach an executive, they're often, right, their days are packed and they don't do any quiet time. So just having space where someone's like, can we slow that down? Mm. Like, can we really look at that? Like, can we really look at what are you telling yourself around this? You know, it's like that for, for them is revelational. Like to have mm. time to slow down their thinking, right? And really listen, like what's underneath that? Okay, well, I'm going to play devil's advocate for fun, okay? Yes. So I'm the CEO, right? And I'm, the, I'm uh, we'll just say I'm a traditional type A yeah. CEO, okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah, listen, hon, I don't have time for that. My answer is I hear you. 
Yeah, so, so I, I really understand. I mean, I'd love, I would love to be able to just schedule some meditation time in the middle of the day, okay? <laughs> I would say, sense. listen, there's no requirement for meditation. Absolutely not. And you only you can decide if what you offer your company best is your thinking. Like, is that one of the best things you offer your company? Is it your thinking? Yes. Oh, wait, is that uh, best? Am I supposed to say no to that? Is it that? <laughs> exactly. But if, if no. it is, if, you're, if the greatest thing you have to offer your company is your thinking, the question I would have is, how do you give yourself time to do just that? Where is there time for you to slow down and come up with new ideas and look at what's happening? How do you do that? If you don't have any time. Do you think that generally speaking, business leaders do agree that their thinking is the greatest contribution they have for their companies? I think many do. Many know that it's their ability to strategize. It's their ability to make business decisions in service to the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So let's go back to the, to, but to the, let's go back and talk about the heart uh, where you can hear the voice of their hearts where they can hear slowing down right into the quiet space where they can hear the voice of their hearts and miracles can occur. The voice of their hearts. What does yes. that mean? What does that mean? <laughs> I mean, it's a great question. Um, I haven't had anyone look at my website so closely, Chris, in a long time. I'm like, wow, I love hearing it shared through you um, in your voice. Uh, <laughs> the voice of the heart is really like, it's really the way I try to describe it for people is like everybody has inner wisdom. Like if you don't like the word heart, it's fine. Like I don't use that word with executives if it doesn't feel appropriate, right? Sure. I'm not here to make them uncomfortable because the work is already uncomfortable. But <laughs> everybody has inner wisdom and, and almost everyone can agree to that. Like we all have inner wisdom. So at a minimum, it's like how do we create a space where together – you can start to have more ability to get in touch with that in service to whatever you want to get handled, right? Whether it's issues in your workplace or whether it's issues in your family or whether it's something you want to create, right? It's like, I don't want to tell someone who wants to create a business down in Key West. I'm not going to tell them how to do it. Sometimes we'll talk about ideas, but I want them to get come with their, like their own creativity is inside of them. So how do we create a space where that can start to come out? That alone right there is another paradigm shift is that all of us have, um, who was the, who was it who talked about the wisdom of the organism? Does that sound know. familiar to you? It was one of the psychologists yeah. in, from, right. back in the day. I can't remember, but that's like, we all have, how did you say it? That we all have, well, we all have inner wisdom. We all, we do. all have inner wisdom. Yeah. Uh, so I feel like that's a paradigm shift right there is to say, is to say okay, well, that includes me. It includes everybody. <laughs> right? I, I am creative. Yeah. And if I can slow down enough, then I can access that creative genius. Now, most people, there's so much judgment and disturbed thinking. And I don't mean disturbed, like disturbed crazy. I mean, there's so much noise of like, uh, that's getting in the way of their ability to access deeper ideas. Uh, noise like, um, like I'm, I'm, I'm too busy or uh, I can't, I have to get this shit done right. or they're depending on me or right. um, we have to hit quota or right. the board is going to you know, kill me if, if right. you know, if we don't increase revenues. Yeah. So the noise is, yeah. Fear-based noise that, so that's paradoxical, right? Because, because the reason for that noise is that they want to succeed. Yeah. And, but and it's interfering with their success. Yeah. Or it's not even that, like there are people who are really successful. <laughs> But imagine how much more successful they could be if if they were if they were able to slow some of this down, some of their thinking, and really be able to see the thinking that's helpful versus the thinking that's not. So how how would you start to encourage someone who's really got the, who always uses language like oh no it's just been a crazy week, you know someone who's totally stretched out. Yeah. Where the, the notion, the, the mere suggestion of slowing down to become more productive sounds stupid to them. Sounds well, like I love that. Really counterproductive. Well, I love that you say that. So I facilitate um, leadership workshops inside of organizations where this very idea of slowing down is both revelational, but also very like 
who has like what? Who has yeah, time? Like, who has for time for that? that? Right. Right. Like you don't. Well, you obviously don't get our our work here. <laughs> right. And and it's like it's really an opportunity for me as a coach. Right. It's like my opportunity to go. Are you willing to do the experiment? Like in other words, hey, after these two and a half days, go back to the way you're doing it. You don't like it? It's fine. Like what do I, I don't know agenda? But are you willing to experiment with the possibility that you are not even nearly as productive as you could be. Give me a couple ways that someone, so I'm in your course, right? Yeah. Or your program, your training program at my company. And give me just like one or two ways that I could experiment. Like what is some, what are a couple things that I would do that I could right. try, right? That might be, that would probably be very uncomfortable, but that I could experiment with. Right. Well, I mean, it's like, look, one of the things that we bring out in the workshop is this idea of let, let's, let's combine it with leadership. Okay. So most leaders, like one of the questions that's posed in the workshop is some of you think, some of you think that if we were to say to people in the organization, Hey, Chris, anyone who would follow Chris, go to the parking lot and go to spot 67. If you would follow Chris as a leader, go there. And some of you think, Oh, I'd have 50 people and you'd be wrong. Mm. And some of you are thinking I'd have two people and you'd be wrong. R wrong in what direction? In that there'd be more. Oh, okay. So I'd be under overestimating and, or underestimating my, and, my, the, how people perceive me as a leader. Right. And in the, in the two and a half days, what we're really working on is getting accurate, getting accurate with your leadership and how you're doing as a leader. Right. So if, and we're talking about leaders without authority, like authority in their title too. Right. A lot of the people I serve already have a, a title that says they're a leader, mm. but that does not equal people want to follow them. <laughs> Just doesn't. We all know that. Right. We all know people have, have a, have a title in their name that says they're a leader and nobody would follow them to the parking lot. Mm -hmm. Nobody. So and when you say we use that, that metaphorically translates into follow them to the parking lot. It means you, like you trust them, you believe in them. <clears throat> right. right. Bingo. Okay. I trust them. I believe in them. And I think, and they're inspiring. Okay. They inspire me. Mm -hmm. They make me better. They make me better. So what we say to people in the room of like, this is two and a half days where you get to get accurate with who you are as a leader. And if, if you know, and here's, a, here's what we always say. Now, you may be like, oh, I'd have 50 people from this organization follow me to the parking lot. Would your family follow you? <laughs> and that's where people start to go, oh. Because mm. they, they can't deny, right? If they're married with children, they're like, ooh, would, would my family follow me? Not yeah. so, so, so So what this ex all of this exploration is a slowing down to look at what is real. What is real? What is accurate? Like what's really you know? going down here? And so slowing down, that's like, it's so obvious, right? But when you're too busy, then it's not so obvious, right? So slowing down to say, how am I truly leading? And then how do you get to that answer? How do you get to the, the, like the, um, the reality of it? Well, it's like there's a number of exercises that happen in the room, right? Where we're yeah. like, all right, like start, let's start, like how, what's our GPS, right? Like are we accurate with how we're showing up? Mm -hmm. And then how do we lead? A lot of people lead through telling. And that's mm -hmm. not really leadership. Yeah. Leadership is not about telling. Leadership is about, right, inspiring from within, mm -hmm. growing people. And, mm -hmm. like, that's, it's not like management. Managing is about telling sometimes, right? Like, mm -hmm. I want you to do this, and I want you to do that, and here's how I want you to do it. Sometimes that's just managing. But mm -hmm. leading is different. Leading is different. and people Leading are, is more like coaching. Leading is more like coaching. And that's really what we start to talk about. How do you use questions as a leader? Like, because there's different levels, right? There's, and that's really what is leadership, right? Leadership is not about telling. It's about asking often. Great. So now with, so individually working with uh, an executive, um, what are, what's one thing that you would encourage them to, let's, let's talk about like time, time. Everybody complains about not having enough time. Yeah. Right. And they should all read Time Warrior. That's right. By the godfather of coaching, Steve Chandler. That's right. Um, what do you tell them about that? Because it's just another common, it's a popular belief, right? 
There's just not okay. enough time in the day. Everyone says that we buy into that bullshit and, that, and, it, and it governs us. Well, if I'm working with an executive, I, I say to them, do I have permission to challenge you? <laughs> That's what have I say. You, yeah. Uh, have you ever had someone say no to that? No, not if they're already working with me. Right. Why would they say right, right, Exactly. Right. They paid me <laughs> right. a substantial sum of money to be challenged. Yeah, exactly. And I still say it because I want them no, to right. know my next sentence is going to be a challenge. Because like, right. I'll say, so you're telling me you don't have enough time. Do you have more, less time than everyone else? Like, are, are we all dealing with 24 hours a day? Or you have less? Were you given less somewhere? Uh-huh. And they'll be like, well, no, we all have the same amount of time. And I'll say, okay. So this is where we start to bring in Steve Chandler's work, right? Yeah. So are you a victim of time? Mm-hmm. Like, because you sound like you are. Yeah. Because right. as Michelle Bauman said to people, mm-hmm. We all vote with two things. We vote with our calendar and we vote with our checkbook. So if I look at your calendar, I'll know what matters to you hmm. and what doesn't. So it's not about you not having enough time. It's about what, you cho- what choices are you making? Is it, is, so if I look at someone's calendar, is it as much as it's telling me what they care about or what they believe is true with respect to what they care about, like in terms of availability? Like, you know, like they don't make time for their kids' games. Right. Right. They do care about that, but they just don't believe that given their circumstance victim, uh, that they can actually have both. Yep. But that's a victim so, mindset. So, so, so what's that? That's a victim mindset, right? Yeah. Like, oh, I like that's a, and, and that's part of the work I, as a coach is to dismantle that. Which requires slowing down. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Woo. That's a whole lot of stuff, my friend. It is a lot of stuff, but it's fun stuff, right? It is fun it's, stuff. It's amazingly empowering stuff. Yeah, it's what's, what could be more fun than helping someone discover that there's an entirely new way to relate to themselves and their thinking and their lives, right? And have different experiences. Like, to me, I think it's really hard to hear about executives who are like 84% of people are dissatisfied with their jobs. Mm. But I'll bet money if we could go in and see out of those 84%, who's in a victim mindset? I bet it'd be a lot. I bet it'd be a lot. I don't know if it would be all. I don't think it'd be all. You didn't say, I don't think it would be all either. But it would be a lot. It would be a lot. A lot. Yeah, and I think then the rest of the 84 would be just governed by beliefs that what they want is not available to them. So it'd be right. victim or scarcity. Yeah. Yep. That's interesting. I've never thought that about that. That's cool. That's helpful. Well, you've really given me... I hope that the, the audience has taken as much out of this conversation as I have... Carolyn. So again, your website where people can go learn more about you and contact you, reach out to you and follow you, uh, carolynfriarjones.com, C-A-R-O-L-Y-N-F-R-E-Y-E-R-J-O-N-E-S.com. Is there any uh, place else? Are you social media active where where people are on LinkedIn? Yeah, you can find me on social media just under my name, Carolyn Frayer Jones. Happy to to connect with people. And then, you know, as you know, Chris, I also run a school now for coaches, which I'm super excited about. It's yeah, on let's my talk website. about it. Yeah, it's on my website. It's the CFJ Coaching Success School. And we're just completing our first year. Great. Which is fun. And we'll be starting next year again in January. So what what can coaches, people who are, are so who's eligible for that? Who's eligible? You have to have, at a minimum, have worked with at least two clients who've paid you something. Okay, so that's not, that's, okay, so, all right. I don't care if they paid you 50 bucks. Okay, so you have but to have broken that threshold where you, you've actually had some reimbursement. Some you've reimbursement. Had the experience of being paid to do coaching. Yeah, and that, okay. that's what you're, that, and that that's what you want to grow into, right? That you want to learn how to become a thriving coach who makes a good living at this, such that you're willing to learn an approach that's going to require you to slow down and connect with people, learn how to be in conversation in a way that then leads to enrollment. Okay. So you are actually teaching some coaching skills. I wouldn't say that. No. I think think, like, look, in the the world we know, Chris, you become a better coach when you know how to enroll effectively. Hmm. You become a better coach because you know how to navigate those conversations. People don't pay money to people they haven't had some kind of experience with that matters to them, right? Right. Like if someone sits with me, they're not gonna pay me if they don't feel like anything occurred. 
Right. So in my world, you become a better coach when you learn how to, to enroll effectively because you learn how to ask deeper questions. So I don't teach actual coaching skills in the school, but people learn it just by being there because they learn how to become better coaches. Because in my school, you have to also submit a report monthly with how you're doing. Oh, nice. And literally, what are your billings? How many conversations have you had? Uh -huh. So we know what gets measured gets done, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. like it's all about like, and then you get to look at how are all the ways I'm not showing up in my work. So, so what, how does the school work? Is it, um, do you get, do you get together live? Yep. Is it online? It's live. So it's any... six, six months live in Los Angeles, once a month, two and a half days. And then in between those two and a half days, there's group calls and there's, partner they do thinking partnerships which you would love chris because we don't do peer coaching in my school we only do thinking partnerships based on nancy klein's work where people all you're doing is listening that's all you're doing the, the coach asks you one question and it's the nancy klein model and then all they do is listen with no interrupting that's it for how long they get to do it twice a month and they listen to each other for 30 minutes each. And I mean, listen. So for 30 minutes, I, I'm a listener. I would say zero words. Yep. So, I, so the other person then is. They have time to think they have time. So, there's, so there'd be like lots of silence. There can be lots of silence, which is wildly uncomfortable. Right. <laughs> right. Oh, no, so I can different. think out loud. I mean, I can also be like, I want to think about what's happening with my daughter right now. And I might have things I want to say out loud, but I might get quiet at times. And then the coach gets to learn how to sit in that. Oh, that's so cool. Wow. So that's right on your website. That's the CFJ. Yes. Now, does, do people ever, does, does anybody ever call you CFJ or is it the name of your school? Yes. No, people uh, is call Is that a nickname of your CFJ? Yeah. Right that's my name at CrossFit. The only thing that goes up on the board is CFJ. And my, <laughs> and my, and my time, which is usually very poor. Really? Oh, yeah. I'm like, I'm, that's what I love about CrossFit. I'm like last. I am not, I mean, that's why I go. I am slow. I am not, I'm, I'm an athlete, but I'm not like a, I'm not a, I'm not a fire breather, but I, I'm okay with that because it challenges me, right? Yeah. I have to look at everybody on the board and I'm often the last one. There's CFJ right at the bottom and I get to go like, wow, look at how I'm thinking about that. Look at me judging myself. And I've been there over 10 years. Nice. I have learned. Oh, yeah. It's been great. Mental toughness, right? Oh, yeah. Good for you. Yeah. Well, CFJ, this has been amazing. Uh, so thank you so much. For, oh. Uh, so, oh, but also, are you, so you're on Facebook? Yep. LinkedIn? Uh, yeah, LinkedIn, but Facebook. Facebook and, is, and, and my email address is on my website, Carolyn okay. Frayer Jones at gmail.com. At People gmail. Email me. And Chris, I just want to say thank you to you. Like, I so appreciate what you're up to. I so appreciate this kind of conversation. It's fun. Yeah. I love how you ask questions and I love that you're very incisive and you really pick up on things. And um, I think it's great work that you're doing. I really, I hear that and I appreciate that. Coming from you, that is a beautiful compliment. So you just made my day. Thank Good. you. Thank you, CFJ. We'll you're be so welcome. Soon. All right. Have an amazing yeah. rest of your day. Thanks. You know, when you spend time with a person who has done their work, it's immediately apparent, isn't it, right? You, like you could tell, even if you weren't watching this, if you're not watching the video blog, but you're listening to the podcast version of this, you can still sense, I'm sure of it, uh, <clears throat> that you can sense, I'm listening to a woman who has really done her work who has really invested a significant amount of time in uh, strengthening her soul and serving. So she just dropped a whole bunch of uh, nuggets of value. <clears throat> and a few of the ones that stood out for me is, I, I mean, I just love this. I'm taking this with me. Courage. Th this could seriously not only change the way I live, but like really, really up level the way I coach. So Carolyn, thank you, CFJ, <clears throat> for this. Courage is not the absence of fear. It's moving forward with it. Isn't that spectacular? I love that. And then the three things, if you could do these things, then absolutely every area of your life would, would be upgraded. Heart-centered listening, 
seeing the loving essence in everyone, including ourselves, and practicing compassionate self-forgiveness. Some profound stuff. Uh, and judgment makes us weaker. So I hope that you found this as, as intriguing and valuable as I did. And uh, thanks for tuning in. And we will see you next time for the next um, Tough Talks episode. And until then, create miracles.